Welcome to the SSI Orbit Podcast, a forum where we explore the ever-growing ecosystems of self-sovereign identity. And I'm your host, Matsur Glod. In today's podcast, I speak with Andre Kudra, Chief Information Officer at ESATIS. ESATIS is a German consultancy with over 20 years of experience in information security, with focuses on identity and access, governance, risk and compliance, and more. More recently, ESATIS has made significant investments in self-sovereign identity, deploying real-world SSI solutions across various industries, and they've made it quite easy to work alongside existing identity and access management solutions. Now, in this conversation, Andre and I talk about how he got into self-sovereign identity and how he looks at it from an InfoSec perspective. We talk about how verifiable credentials could play in concert with existing enterprise systems. We talk about how SSI fits nicely within zero trust models. We talk about low-hanging fruits for enterprises to use SSI today, and we also touch upon what the German ecosystem looks like and how they look at self-sovereign identity. Enjoy the conversation. Okay, we're now recording. Hey, Andre, how's it going? Excellent, Matthew. I'm having a great start of the week already, so hope you are, you're you're good. Uh, had a good start as well. Yeah, same thing here. Just been busy weeks all year so far, but I think that speaks to uh, the space that we're in, the whole self-sovereign identity space. I think both of us uh, are quite excited about uh, the direction it's going and the potential it has to really take off in 2021. Exactly. Uh, same same, uh, same view here. Awesome. Um, well, thanks again for doing this. Uh, for the folks that uh, maybe don't know you, do you mind giving a little bit of an introduction on yourself, Andre, and uh, the company you represent, eSatis? Yes, absolutely. And thanks for inviting me to this podcast. Um, I'm, I'm Andre Kudra. I'm one of the uh, board members of eSatus AG. Uh, I'm I'm in the space of information security since the turn of the millennium, basically, and Esatos is also in that space. Um, we are very active in the in the domain of identity and access management and everything related to that. We also do um, governance, risk, and compliance work in the information security sector, and so on. I am personally uh, I'm not an uh, not an IT guy per education, but at heart, so I have a business degree and a doctorate in in business administration. And uh, I'm, I'm a long-term uh, advocate of self-sovereign identity, so to say. So my, my company is active in that space uh, since it dates back to 2015, uh, uh, in, in fact. So we have, we have worked in the SSI space uh, with a heavy exposure since 2016. I um, have written a lot of papers uh, in in German, so we are we are here based close to Frankfurt in Germany. So I have um, I have quite a track record of of publishing stuff about SSI in in German. Uh, went to quite a number of conferences here and tried to promote the benefits of SSI quite early on because I uh, felt it was the the path ahead for for the mess that we are seeing in the identity and access world. So I I'm I'm a big fan. I've, I'm a big early on fan. And my company uh, um, has supported the activities there. We have continuously grow, grown our team uh, for SSI folks. And um, to be exact, we have now turned from a, from a mainly consulting-driven company and, and uh, software development company to a product company. We have developed a, our own solution for identity and access management based on self-sovereign identity technology. So the future for us is... Uh, is well paved with verifiable credentials and it's and all that good stuff. Awesome. Yeah, I think the future is quite bright. Um, and so, so I think but both of our companies uh, have had similar trajectories, I would say, or but both of us were in the consulting space. Um, and I think both got excited uh, with self-sovereign identities in the respective areas we were in. So yourself in, in InfoSec identity and access and us just coming from the decentralized solutions uh, consulting space. I think uh, a light bulb went off uh, in, in both of our heads a little while back. And I would say probably you a bit earlier if you guys were thinking about this since 2015, but self-sovereign identity and verifiable credentials and did seemed like really um, something that is needed to take us in the next evolution of, of internet transactions and trust on the internet and trust within systems within an enterprise and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm just... <laughs> Um, did you ever consider writing a book on, on this stuff, uh, being in the position you're in in Germany? And uh, 
I, obviously I know all the different organizations that you're a part of and your contributions there. Is this something that interests you at some point? Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, and in fact, I have uh, contributed a bit to Drummond Reed's uh, a book that's in the pipeline. You probably all all know about the as the, the major SSI book that's that's coming our our way. Um, I've um, I've written a chapter about identity and access management. Uh, I think it will be on, uh, available in the online version. So, I'm as you as you said, and um, I'm. I'm uh, not only the board member of of Esados AG. I'm, I have I wear many different hats. I have to be uh, a little bit cautious where where I'm wearing which one. So I'm I'm also uh, a trustee of the Sovereign Foundation. My company uh, Esados AG is uh, one of the early day stewards. So we are founding steward of Sovereign, and um, we are the first one uh, who had a note in in Germany. We are um, also active in, in the sovereign community in many different working groups. Uh, one of my board colleagues is uh, now also a member of the Technical Governance Board of, of Sovereign. Uh, we are also um, a founding and steering member of, of uh, Trust Over IP Foundation. So this makes us very proud. So this is the, the first year of, of the foundation and there's so many great deliverables coming our, our way. And uh, yeah, we are very active also in the MyData community. MyData is um, a global movement um, promoting a, um, an open and um, individual centric data economy so that you are in control of, uh, of your personal data and, and have the, uh, the, the decision power to decide where, it, where it's going and where not. So we are, we are advocating SSI in this MyData community and uh, I'm also um, a board member of the German IT Security Association Teletrust, just recently since end of last year. So, in all these in the, all these different functions, it it well even if if I don't actively pursue it, it often comes back to discussing SSI matters and decentralized data economy and how we can make digitalization really really work. So I'm 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 in fact very very eager to, to promote these thoughts in, in all these uh, different organizations if, if the topic comes up. And necessarily, uh, I think this is something that we need for anything that is related to digitalization. So I'm, I'm um, not only um, an entrepreneur in that sense, in that, in that space, even though the company is around for, for many, many years more, uh, I, I feel myself as a, as a well, as a bridging function be between all these communities, so that they that they are able to uh, be involved in SSI and and uh, can integrate it into their own thinking. Yeah. So that's that's basically what I'm up to. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm trying to to put the, a couple of these things in in writing once in a while. Uh, I have not embarked on a on a full book. Maybe it's a good uh, good idea to or, um, to at least translate some of the SSI. Uh, standard uh, book that's coming out soon uh, into into German. So that's a good idea, Matthew. We can take it up. Yeah, maybe you'll you'll do the German version, and I could do the French version. I think uh, been ha having similar thoughts here, being in Canada, with uh, French being uh, one of the the two national languages here. That uh, there's a lot of opportunities to really uh, uh, put the stuff in in various languages and. Um, you know, honestly, all, all these contributions that you're doing, I honestly don't know how you uh, keep up with, with all these things, but it's just incredible what you guys have been doing. And it really, I think both you and I advocate for the need for collaboration and the need for bringing more and more people into here. And the, these decentralized technologies are only going to be as strong as the, the respective ecosystems that come with it. So it's just tremendous work that, uh, that you're doing overall to really advocate for this stuff and teach people and bring folks into it. And um, I'm happy to be doing some of this work with you inside of the Trust Over IP as well. Um, one of the little contributions that we're trying to do overall to grow the whole space. Um, so I, I guess just taking a step back, um, you being in the InfoSec space, uh, working a lot with identity and access management and doing consulting around there. Um, what were some of the, I guess this is the best way to learn uh, or to think about new solutions is when you're actually practicing something and you're identifying all sorts of problems. Um, <laughs> it seems like that's the space that, that you definitely came from. So what were some of the triggers inside of the work that you and Isatis was doing uh, in identity and access management and in general InfoSec where you said, hey, wait a second, there, there, there needs to be a better way of doing this. And, and uh, what are some of these problems that kind of led you towards decentralized identity? 
Yeah, I think this is an, an excellent uh, story to tell. I I always felt the, the customers uh, which we address, and these are usually enterprise organizations with uh, tens of thousands of, of employees, they are stuck in a, in a basically never ending nightmare of um, interwoven complex identity and access landscape. So to be exact, these companies, they, they don't employ just one solution. They often have five, 10 different, maybe 15 different identity and access related products that they try to make work together somehow. And this usually doesn't work. So they have tried to tailor their own bespoke identity and access landscape to address their very particular needs, uh, often in regulated industries like the financial sector, because they had to do something, they had to solve a certain audit uh, requirement uh, to, to just, um, well, fix something uh, that was broken in, in one space, and then they decided to buy another product for it. And then they realized, oh, this is now related to identity and access management. So this was an ever ongoing circle of, of um, trying to solve that identity and access space for good, which didn't work out. So they they kind of increased their their complexity while trying to save the same problem to solve the same problem over and over again. So when I, I was never happy with this uh, with this uh, projects and and being a consultant in that space, I always felt obliged to try to make the life of my client easier. But it was so complicated because sometimes we were brought in because they wanted to solve something and they said, "Well, we have bought this product. Can you help us integrate?" And we, we usually said yes, but have you considered doing it with the stuff you already have? But sometimes sometimes it was too late, and sometimes they already had allocated the budget and all this. You probably know this from from the work uh, with your clients. So it was cumbersome, and it is still cumbersome. And when I ran into SSI early on, I said, wow, with this, we have the opportunity to cut certain components out of this identity and access life cycle without um, making the situation uh, any, any worse from a feature perspective, but cutting so much complexity away. And um, this, this may sound very, very abstract now, but uh, we can make it more tangible. So, if you, if you go to an organization and you start to work there and you need to be onboarded. So you have this, this process called onboarding and which requires you have to request the access rights to every single system that you want to use or need to use. And you, you, you often do not know all the systems. You don't know all the processes that you have to, to, to go through to order the access. And you certainly um, don't have any idea how long it will take. Uh, otherwise you would have, um, you would have, uh, uh, ask yourself the question: uh, Am I up to it? Um, am I up for it? So, we have we have done a lot of these these projects, and with SSI, we have now the opportunity to cut all these kind of cumbersome processes uh, to a great extent, and even remove certain items of the identity and access lifecycle. And for this example that I've given for the onboarding, we have um, come up with a solution where you just formulate a rule which gives you access to the application, which can be um, underpinned by SSI attributes out of verifiable credentials, which basically gives you access because you have um, you are in a certain function or role in the organization and the application knows if you're approaching and you can prove you're in the function, you will be let in. So the easiest example is if I prove to our own Wiki system, which we use, it's a, a standard product from Atlassian called Confluence. You probably all know it. Uh, we have figured, we have equipped it with a rule and said anyone who can prove he's an employee of Esatus AG can access the system. And how do I prove this? Because everyone, when, when um, she or he joins the company is equipped with a credential, which is called employee credential, which states um, uh, she or he is a member of Esatus AG. And then in the next second, um, she just presents this credential to the application and the application knows, okay, I can, I can let her in. And this is the beauty of it. And it can be much more complex uh, from a rule perspective, but still easy to grasp for people because they know if I prove to the application, I am a sales manager, I'm an IT developer, I'm the HR guy and I work for the company, the application will let me in because the rule says so. And with this, we have a powerful tool at hand 
to make uh, life easier for everyone involved, the organization, because um, less complexity is, is required to maintain the systems. Um, the decision takers uh, in the companies, because they, they know uh, they have something that is future proof and the end user, because he doesn't have to struggle with the comp uh, complex processes anymore. It's just feeling so much more natural and uh, giving us the, the tools at hand to port this uh, natural, uh, yeah, proving of, of something you are to a certain uh, scenario uh, in a digital way to access applications. So this was a long, long speech, but I think the it all boils down to we have a great chance to cut complexity, to throw out lots of cluttered architectures and make the life for everyone uh, involved easier, particularly the end user, because he just does natural stuff or stuff that feels natural to him. Yeah, that, that, it's amazing that you, at least this use case that you just described that you, you use internally at Isatis uh, anyways to begin with. So I, I love the stories too of uh, companies or organizations that are eating their own dog food <laughs> at the same time as they're, they're trying to, to push these products to market. And I'm sure, uh, I'm sure your whole company becomes a nice uh, beta users for, for this type of thing before it goes out. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, um, just to add to this, but, but, um, we obviously started, uh, right away for, for, for ourselves to do it. And we have also some, some nice little, uh, rollout documentation for people to read and also video, uh, illustrating how we did that on our own. But, um, we are working with a lot of customers and not of all, not all of them can be publicly named, but, um, uh, we can, we can maybe post some, some, some links of, of customers who are in fact, um, now public and are, are known that they have uh, at least are, ex at, are either experimenting with SSI technology or are rolling it out productively. So I think that this, this, this kind of lighthouse projects help us to, to um, foster the momentum and show to everyone, look, this is not just a laboratory technology. This can be used and can be practically applied. So these are, these, I, I, I totally uh, second uh, what you said in the beginning. I think this is a great year for SSI because we see so much movement, not, not people talking about it and, and thinking it's a good idea. They embark on projects and get stuff going and, and, and show it and demonstrate the viability of, of the whole uh, technology space. Totally, totally. And so, so, so if, if we just take a look at your, uh, your onboarding of a new employee use case that, that uh, you've implemented, and I'm sure you've implemented with, uh, with customers as well. Um, so, so as an employee, uh, if I'm being onboarded to a new organization, I need to request or I need to have access and authorization to access different functions and functions and features within various enterprise systems. You named uh, Confluence uh, being one, like if I'm a developer, it could be Jira. If I'm anyone in the company, it could be Slack, for example, if we're using that as a messaging platform within the company. Yeah. So just the process from an employee standpoint is uh, for an employee joining your company, what they would do is they would use the Satis wallet, which which uh, allows them to um, connect with eSatus, I guess, uh, build a direct connection with eSatus. It allows them to receive a credential, like the employee credential from eSatus. Um, then they're able to use this stuff to access the systems. Um, but does does the way it work, is is the credential that the employee is using to access the system kind of the, the outer layer? Do you still need to talk to the existing SSO system or the existing IAM systems that are underneath? Like, how, how do you guys look at that? Yeah, I, I, I was omitting a bit of the, the technical um... Um, underpinnings of, of how this all works. So in fact, uh, um, we have not um, tailor-made solutions for, for the Atlassian products or any other products or, or Slack or whatever. We are leveraging existing um, identity and access protocols. So there is obviously modern applications and also not so modern ones um, usually have some kind of capability to working with existing identity and access management tools and, and platforms. So um, what, we, what we have done is we have integrated standard gateways to this common protocols. So you can, you can connect an application that uh, has a SAML connector. You can connect with OAuth2 or OpenID Connect. We can also provision to any type of LDAP directory 
are, which can be an active directory, which is quite common, or any other type of LDAP directory. We can we can provision in a database if that's uh, how an application manages uh, the access rights. So we basically put the solution uh, in the middle of acting like an identity provider or kind of um, providing the underlying functionality that the application needs and talks by default. So we are not doing something new. You don't have to go through development cycles for an applications. We just provide the standard mechanism for authentication and authorization that the application knows by default. And this is how, how we, we, we built the bridge. So we are, we are looking at on the one side, on the SSI side, so the future side, we're looking at credentials and attributes coming out of credentials. And on the other side, um, we call it the classic side. Some of my colleagues call it the legacy side. Uh, so I, um, I, I prefer the classic term because I think these uh, standard protocols will be around for quite a while. Um, we, we, um, we, we look from both perspectives. So one on the SSI side and one on the on the existing side of, of applications. And in the middle, we have we have set the, the product which we call self. Um, this may uh, this name may change, but nevertheless, um, it's 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 like an IDP in the middle. And at its core, we have this rule engine. Exactly what I said, you you tell the application, um, if the uh, if the user proves he's an, is a member of uh, Northern Block or Isadusaki, then he will be let in. And this kind of rules we 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 make easy to formulate for for an admin person or for the application owner, and uh, he can just define these rules, and the rest will automatically happen. So it's 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 not cumbersome at all. It can be it's it's fully configurable. You don't have to code. You just provide the necessary. Um, strings for connecting the application to the to the to the backend to the self backend and to determine the credentials you want to use and that's it and then you're all set yeah that's that's awesome and then for from it, it seems like a good story and we definitely see that uh, as well for organizations that like it's great to think that hey I, I could use ssi and verifiable credentials to do all sorts of processes but it's also impossible to think that an organization that has invested uh, millions of dollars or, or whatever in inside of their infosec systems and their identity and access management systems are, are going to throw that away too so i really like how there's kind of that uh, there's an intersection there where you're, you're able to talk to what's there and that what's existing there without touching it but on the outside when it's all about uh, the the employee or the customer's experience you're able to make it faster you're able, able to lower friction uh, you're able to make these processes more scalable, and ultimately, it could become more secure as well. I assume it is. It is more sec uh, more secure as well, uh, because we are getting also rid, obviously, in the same goal uh, of usernames and passwords, because you just don't need them anymore. Uh, the the uh, the brilliance is we can even uh, run um, the the classic and the new in um, in parallel. So, for 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 some organizations, we have just equipped certain department with a new functionality uh, and they download the wallet app they can by the way uh, not only use our wallet app but any other aries compliant wallet app and uh, and basically do the good stuff so you just at the point where you usually log in you give the uh, the possibility to use an alternative authentication provider and you can basically run both in parallel so those um, those people that are already equipped with new stuff can use the new stuff and the others can use the the old stuff or they can even change but uh, i think if they are if they're used to having the convenience um, of the of the new solution they will they will opt for the new solution so you can even gradually transition from from your old setup to a new setup with out having a big bang approach and all the the problems that may come with uh, such one right and i i, I guess my, my next question here uh, I, I don't know how, how deep you want to go into it because I'm, I'm sure some of this uh, is, is proprietary or maybe uh, um, uh, proprietary with any status but w when you talk about um, in integrating today into existing systems to then tomorrow potentially move away from these systems and having more of a direct connection with applications. So really using the, the user's wallet as a decentralized IDP and directly gaining access and stuff to systems. Um, 
there's one type of organization or one industry that potentially gets threatened with this. And this is the whole identity and access management space and the providers here. Um, I would be curious to know kind of from your experience and because you obviously have relationships with some of these companies coming from the consulting space. Um, do you work directly with them? How do they see this whole thing? Uh, do they feel threatened? Like what, what's been your whole experience working with these existing IM vendors? Yeah, let's start uh, with, with the facts. I think uh, the IIM market globally is a billion dollar market. So there's a lot of players who earn a lot of money uh, with, uh, with this solutions that they provide today, be it products or services, which are all based on the fact that organizations have to maintain their complex landscape. So they pay lots of license fees, lots of maintenance fees, and lots of... Um, uh, of, of money and people to, to maintain this whole architecture. So there's lots of people who earn lots of money with these inefficiencies. So obviously everyone who understands that the SSI and the merits of SSI are basically sawing at the, the, these branches of complexity uh, will see this as a threat. And this is exactly what, what, we, what we see from, from our interactions with the vendors. Um, we have, we have uh, in fact, uh, entertained lots of uh, offers and, uh, and discussions with, uh, with the existing IAM vendors. And you, you just type it in, in in your search engine of your choice and you will find uh, the, the usual suspects. So most of them um, were said, uh, it's interesting, uh, but we are not interested at this point. And uh, basically, uh, there were no shows in any further discussions because I had the feeling um, they, they didn't want to incorporate these, uh, these ideas at this point. At some point, they may, be, uh, they may have just no other choice than to do it. Because SSI is ultimately open, interoperable, and is compatible to all the stuff that's out there. So you cannot ignore it forever. So if, if an organization or a customer approaches you and tells you, look, uh, I want to make this work with your product, uh, how do I do it? And it just objects and says it doesn't work, then it, it's just not the truth because it it will work and it will be it will be integratable into existing architectures. In fact, it's all there. You just have to do it. If you want to do it, you can do it today. So you can use our stuff, or you can also uh, use other solutions. And um, this again is is also the brilliance of it because if it if it works with your verifiable credentials, you could even basically swap the whole. Uh, uh, the whole underlying architecture with your custom-made stuff or with another vendor product that does the same because you're still working with the data that you're that you're working with anyways it's stored in the verifiable credentials so it's just what you make out of it and we are making an identity and access solution out of it but you may use it for other stuff where you just uh, want to do one particular thing and you just don't need the whole iam solution scope for it but you can in fact um make it work with the existing landscape and uh Yes, the existing players, uh, I think they are now seeing that this is coming. Because if you look at, at all the conferences and all, the, um, all the, the articles being published, this is not a niche topic anymore. This is going mainstream. People are talking about it. Um, the, the IT savvy folks um, understand uh, the benefits. And now it's basically everywhere. It's also on, uh, on the tables of of big corporates and uh, at, at high level pol pol political decision takers. I think we're seeing the, the whole movement for decentralization in general, like uh, it's a, it gets spearheaded a lot, it seems by the, the whole crypto space. And <laughs> there's, uh, I, I think we're seeing it there in the crypto space. We're seeing it kind of, um, people are thinking more and more about decentralization as an option for stuff like social media, for example. And I think people are starting to think about it more and more for uh, business processes within organizations, but also business processes in and between different organizations and vendors and partners and stuff like that. And th that's definitely where uh, self-sovereign identity truly shines. And I, I think I, I echo your thoughts that it is ready to deploy today. Um, and I, I have actually seen... Uh, there are some larger vendors. I'm not sure if it was Okta or something, but they're starting slowly to talk about uh, the centralized identity or putting out an article here and there. But you, you definitely know that uh, people are thinking about it and its, it's popularity is growing overall. Um, so you, it's being presented in conferences. Another thing that 
um, I, I've, I guess I've seen a lot more over the past few years that's been getting more and more popular. And I'm sure if we did a, a, a Google Trends search on, on this, it, we'd probably see that it's, uh, it's been go- rising in popularity, but it's, it's the whole concept of zero trust. Yes. Um, and so um, do you mind for, for folks listening, just kind of giving just a brief overview of, of what zero trust is? Why, like, why is this becoming uh, such a popular uh, framework or method that uh, companies are looking to, to implement? Um, and, and how does SSI play into this model? Does it complement it? Does it do similar things? Uh, how do you look at that? Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. I think um, uh, if you are coming from from the security domain, you're you're familiar with uh, with these uh, terms like a perimeter protection and uh, like uh, like the old school things. You you want to maintain your your firewall and only let stuff in and out that you you, you like. So I think with the, the the paradigm of zero trust, it has become evident for everyone within the security industry and also outside of it uh, that basically um, this perimeter thing is no longer valid so you you you're you have to assume that you have an attacker already within your perimeter within your your, your closed and own shop or um, if it if uh, he's not there uh, he can get there with a um, reasonable amount of, of time just by social engineering whatever so the understanding is that you cannot basically trust anything that's inside your perceived perimeter or outside of it. So you basically have to consider um, asking for certain authentication before any type of asset, uh, data store, feature, or, or tool is, is used. So if, if you think it's worth protecting, you have to consider increasing the trust level at the point where this decision has to be made. So before any type of, of um, asset of the company, like a, like a system, like your, your laptop or your, your PC or your, your uh, Wiki system is accessed, you have to make a, a, a reasonable amount of assurance so that you know that the person who, who is accessing it is in fact eligible. So this is the kind of paradigm that we are looking at. You basically cannot trust anything or you have to uh, increase the trust level at the point where where actually the access happens. So, and this is exactly um, what we can facilitate now with with self-sovereign identity. We can can basically use the facts that we have about users, which which are stored in the verifiable credentials to make them present just the right amount of stuff that we need for the assurance that he or she is eligible to access a certain resource. So this can be in the easy example that we have uh, used in the beginning, uh, just you have to prove you're a member of the company. Sometimes this may not be enough. If you want to access a certain resource that is just um, in the Wiki system for managing the sales pipeline, you may have to prove additionally that you're a sales manager and you need a different type of validation, different type of credential um, with a different attribute to prove that. In some cases, if you want to close a contract, you may even need a, um, more validation like your, your name and address. And maybe you even need a state issued um, identity credential that gives you the power to sign a contract in, via digital means um, so that you, that you basically step up the authentication and ultimately authorization with the attributes that you uh, that you have to provide and as as you as you see what we can do with ssi that it contains very that you that you have verifiable credentials which contain attributes about yourself which have been attested by uh, another party so that you can use them anywhere um, shows how this is ideally suited to fulfill these zero trust paradigm with this kind of on the fly step up provisioning of information items that give you access. Yeah, so I, I hope that uh, makes it a little bit uh, transparent that this is this is definitely not um, not in contradiction, but in, uh, to be exact, to very much aligned that the zero trust paradigm is absolutely fulfillable with the self-sovereign identity technology uh, that we have at hand. 
Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's a mechanism that, that facilitates achieving a zero trust paradigm within an organization. Um, and the, 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 there are others and uh, there are others that we see, I guess, through different identity and access management systems that are trying to fulfill the zero trust paradigm, but self-sovereign identity fits uh, quite nicely into there. And then, so, so it fits quite nicely into there. And the thing with, with SSI is like you, you go down the board on the privacy by design principles, the security by design principles. It's just, um, it's just superior in a lot of different ways. Agreed. Yeah, we, we didn't go uh, into that detail. You have uh, the, the, the possibility, obviously, which is also a requirement of selective disclosure. So you don't present the full magnitude of attributes in a credential. You just present what you're asked for. And then you still have the decision power. Do you want to share this information? Uh, you can even do this, uh, this good stuff like zero knowledge proof where you, uh, and using this, this example, you don't disclose your birth date if you want to prove a certain, that you're above a certain age. So all this good stuff is possible with, um, with a zero knowledge proof type credentials. Selective disclosure is probably something that is much more needed and in use at these days, because this is exactly uh, how it also works in our example. So our employee credential holds more information than just the, the, uh, the attribute um, uh, employ, uh, employed uh, by company um, Isatos. It in includes the starting date, maybe a fixed end date. If the, if the person, um, uh, if the contract is, is um, limited in the time perspective, it contains certain other attributes, but if we want to take a decision, if the person is able to access the resource, we just ask for this one line. Are you employed by Isado Zagi? And that's it. It's um, the whole selective disclosure. And also like we talked about the movement of decentralization, but the, there's a, it, it's tied in very closely as well with the movement of, uh, of privacy and privacy by design solutions too. So something like selective the disclosure we're seeing, and I'm sure you're seeing too, it, it's a nice selling point on its own to say, hey, you could really improve the customer experience if you're using this type of thing with your customer or employees or whoever you're dealing with, right? To really be able to um, give them confidence through uh, transparency and give them confidence through their ability to control what they're, what they're sharing and to know what they're sharing. Um, the world seems to be moving that way. And I, I think that where, where you guys are located in Germany, being within the EU and the different uh, frameworks and laws that are being pushed forward uh, and some of the data privacy laws like the, the GDPR and the, there's a, a lot of other ones that I guess we could get into different frameworks. Um, I guess self-sovereign identity falls in quite nicely there as well. And I am, from what I've learned from you is it seems like the, the government in Germany is really buying into this uh, stuff as well. And so I, I guess my question from this is um, me being in Canada and there's folks listening to this that are a little throughout the world, um, folks like ourselves that are really trying to push for decentralized identity and to, to, to really grow the ecosystem within our respective countries. Um, how, how and why has the German ecosystem kind of grown at the speed which it has grown so far and what is really brought in? Because there's tons of government organizations and there's tons of large companies that have kind of joined this whole ecosystem and this mission for decentralized identity. So do, do you mind just talking about why? Uh, is there something in the water in Germany that people are drinking that uh, <laughs> is pushing them towards this? Well, um, actually, I think um, there's there's many aspects to that. Let's, let's maybe start with um, the whole uh, crypto thing that uh, has been happening in Germany quite early on. Um, and I'm not saying SSI uh, has a terrible lot to do with crypto, but I think we have a, a strong uh, kind of blockchain DLT type ecosystem of, of people and companies, which kind of fueled the SSI ecosystem as well. So I think in, in general, there is there's a, a, a huge uh, thrive for innovation. Um, even if, if we see that in, in some areas, not not really, really to a great extent, but in some areas we we, we really see it. So we have a, a vibrant ecosystem of um, of innovative companies, uh, particularly in the blockchain and DLT space. So I think this this kind of helped to foster the discussion around this, and um, also build showcases that this stuff works really early on. And um, this um, was 
in in the end also recognized by um, by um, well venture capitalists and um, political decision takers, because it wasn't is was an ever growing um, well communication stream towards these decision takers. Look, there is some stuff coming your way. You want to be prepared. Do you want to join and so on? So I think this um, this resulted in the fact that it was realized and recognized, and some um, major things happened uh, in, in Germany. So basically, I think we have a couple of, of different streams now underway. So the, the one that is probably often talked about and widely recognized is everything that's coming out of the, the um, funded projects by the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs called showcase projects about secure digital identity. And they have they have um, issued a, a funding proposal to basically everyone who is in that space and, um, and called for a competition of six months to propose solutions in the digital identity space. And we had a whole lot of uh, SSI type solutions being proposed in that competition phase. There were 11 projects and now it, it boiled down to uh, being three or four in the end who are funded for three years uh, with each of, uh, of a budget of 15 million euro in the consortium. So we have now, and it, it boiled down to four projects in the end, we have now four projects which are co-funded by the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs. And at least two of the three are dedicated to promoting SSI and uh, showing that it works. And one of, the, one of these projects is called ID Union. You may have uh, uh, heard about this. This kind of originated in, uh, in the work that was early on done by a company called Main Incubator. They are a subsidiary company of Commerce Bank. And they proposed um, a couple of years back the Lissy project, which kind of produced one of the first um, um, self-sovereign identity wallet apps. And this was also continued a little bit uh, on the side. However, this led to the fact that we, we got together in the competition phase uh, for this um, um, economic ministry backed project called SSI for Germany. So we had a small consortium which basically transitioned all the work, work, work there and where, where we were a part of. And now we are rebranding again and calling it ID Union. And ID Union is not just the name of the project, it's also the name of uh, a Hyperledger Indie based test network that has been created in the competition phase of the project. So this is one of the major work streams, ID Union with uh, its, its test network, which is going to be a transition to um, cooperative um, legal entity model and running production network. And in parallel, the uh, state funded project of the Ministry of Economic Affairs also being called ID Union. But this is just one of the, the bigger things. We have uh, another thing going on, which is, it, it, which is um, driven by public sector organizations. It's called Gov Digital. And they are um, planning to provide blockchain and DLT based services dedicated to the public sector. They also have in their roadmap to create a Hyperledger Indie based network at some point in time. I'm not uh, deeply involved in that. As I said, it's uh, basically completely run by public sector players. And so data center providers and so on from the public sector. So they are doing a, a great job of advocating that. And I, I think at some point they will also come up with a Hyperledger Indie based project. And now um, coming to the, to the major thing that's going on, you probably uh, or maybe have, have heard that uh, um, in the highest political uh, decision taker circles in Germany, the, the topic of digital identity came up. Uh, last year, and it culminated to a meeting uh, run by Angela Merkel in the beginning of December last year, um, inviting C-level representatives of 18 companies, and there is a public communication uh, on the Bundesregierung website, to discuss the future of digital identity. And in this uh, meeting, um, they also covered self-sovereign identity. And um, this led to the fact that everyone thought this is a good idea, we need to do something about it because this is maybe a differentiating factor for us here in Germany and Europe overall and uh, to kind of be able to counterbalance what's going on in the rest of the world. So they said it's such a good idea that we are now embarking 
on a, uh, on a project together with uh, a pilot for a certain use case based on Hyperledger in the technology, which is currently underway. I, I cannot tell you a terrible lot about the details of that project. We are um, um, looking at it because we are also part of ID Union, and obviously this is uh, this is going in alignment with what's happening in in, in ID Union and the other uh, projects, and uh, what the Chancellor's Office is doing. But um, I think there is such a great momentum with what they started uh, end of last year which will have a huge visibility when they come up and go live with a pilot. And I know that there are more pilots planned than just the one that's underway now. So this year will be basically full of, of pilots being driven by the chancellor's office uh, and in conjunction with uh, uh, players from the uh, German and European SSI ecosystem. So I think this is very, very um, well important and, and a lighthouse for getting SSI on, on track and uh, obviously, everyone is looking closely at, at what, uh, what these uh, people are doing there. And uh, I have really high hopes that this will fuel the SSI ecosystem and the whole momentum here in Germany and broader Europe tremendously. Yeah, well, I, I could say here in Canada, we're, we're looking quite closely at uh, everything that's being achieved in Germany. Um, and I mean, we, we have great community here as well, a big blockchain DLT community. So you definitely see uh, a lot of this stuff kind of sped up and it, it's a different way of thinking, right? When you start thinking about just the decentralized uh, models. And so folks that come from the blockchain and DLT space, it's just, it makes sense quicker. Um, and, but, you know, I, we're lucky here in Canada that the governments are making investments into this stuff as well, but uh, it's really significant and people should really look at, and we'll link some of these projects in the show notes if people are, are interested in looking a little more into what's happening in Germany, but uh, Germany's just really a, a leader in the space. Um, for, I guess for folks listening that, uh, um, if, if, they're, if they're looking to deploy stuff in Germany, I think there's lots of resources we could point to, uh, stuff in Canada as well. We could point to a lot of stuff for, for people in other countries in the world that really want to push self-sovereign identity forward or decentralized identity forward in their respective countries. Um, if their public sector it, and various governments aren't making the same investments or the same prioritizations as say Germany or Canada, um, are there some low-hanging fruits for entrepreneurs or innovators that are looking to, to really push this forward? Could, could, could SSI see traction in a place without government involvement? I think it could. Uh, as you see here in, in Germany, we are we having different streams, right? So we, we are not, um, this is not completely aligned and not everything is, is uh, doing the exact same thing. So as you see, we have Gov Digital being a addressing the public sector. We have ID Union basically attracting uh, lots of businesses and 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 very variety of players. We have these other activity going on from from um, the Chancellor's office team. So I think this this will in the end need some some alignment and will need to pull the strings together and also bring together what's happening uh, in broader Europe like EPSI and ESIF. And there is, uh, you, you probably are aware of, of the other initiatives that are going on in, in Finland, for example, with Findi, in Austria with Minus Sichere ID. There's, there's a different uh, streams going on, but as, as they are now recognizing, um, there's st stuff happening in, in, in the same areas. So they are all eager to collaborate and get these, these things together. So I think um, for, for entrepreneurs who want to be active in that space, uh, there's a great uh, opportunity to leverage this momentum that's that's growing there, and uh, I'm, I'm particularly also looking in 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 your direction in in Canada because I know the ecosystem is very strong there as well, and uh, in fact I think the the political people um, uh, have made requests to to be connected to one another to talk about these projects. So I I have a, a quite a, a hope that this will will also lead to something that is beneficial to all of us. So I think as SSI is open, it's it's basically everyone can put services on top of it. So even for, for Gov Digital, for example, which is dedicated to public sector partners, they may decide to let private companies offer their services on their chain on their chain at some point, on their on their DLT. So I think that this is the the beauty of it. 
that if the ecosystem is open as it is in SSI, and at least the underlying technologies uh, are comparable. So, I mean, obviously everybody is maybe aware. I'm I'm a fan of Indy and Aries. So, Hyperledger Indy and Aries are our chosen stacks uh, at this point. So we we put uh, all our development on on these uh, technologies. However, in the end. If we have verifiable credentials as the common denominator, you can do anything with 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 any chain and, and system if if as long as, as it is based on the paradigm of, of verifiable credentials. So being as, as open as it is, it is a great chance for, for everyone in the world to basically provide solutions um, with these uh, parameters uh, in mind. So if you think about, okay, I'm I'm an expert in India and Aries, I want to build stuff on that this is the best chance to do it. If you think, okay, I want to be a little bit broader, I want to work with verifiable credentials, nevertheless, what technology is underlying, um, you can do that. You can come up with a solution that is tailored around that. So there's great potential because there is no boundaries um, between organizations and ultimately countries anymore. Because if we have the interoperability that we envision with SSI, then we can basically do anything from everywhere. Yeah. So I think the, the chances are, are very good that we have um, the, the innovative players who are in that in that field and understand these these parameters and understand the technology. They they can immediately expand their business beyond their so perceived home market because it's just something that everyone needs. And I think this is this is something that that has never been um, available to that extent uh, before because if we have this common architecture and open standards. You can basically deliver services and exchange the services uh, without any limitations from an organizational or jurisdictional point of view. Well, we, what we tell people is exactly what you said. If you're adhering to the, the standards and norms that, that people are moving towards, it just comes down to yourself as an individual or yourself representing uh, a company or an organization, just understanding where you sit within the overall ecosystem of what you're trying to do. Um, different public entities have different roles within their existing ecosystem. They will move at their speed and they will do what they're doing, but it doesn't stop you from getting into all sorts of different use cases. And what Isatis is doing is just great proofs of this, where you're able to really drastically improve um, user experience, whether it's of your employees and your customers using something like self-sovereign identity. And you don't necessarily need a government to shoot ID sure that it's going to be great when these things come it becomes another tool within the ecosystem it becomes another piece of data that you could add on top to what you you have today but uh there's so much you could do today and i think you guys are again great proofs of uh, uh an early movers in the space and really uh, uh, a company that we looked up to uh quite high when we first got into the space because uh, we really liked the way you were approaching this uh, much, much appreciated, and it, it, it doesn't stop there. So with the with the identity nexus space, I think we have just done the natural progression of our work, and uh, now with ID Union, we have numerous different use cases which basically apply the same technology, and we have all the we, we have we have everything. We have the full stack now available, with a little tweak here and there. We can basically address different type of types of use cases. So. For example, we can we, we are building now uh, what we call a, a Schüler wallet, student wallet, uh, with one of the project streams we are doing. We have worked with a local community of, of Langen. Um, they provide something, it's called the Tafel, which means they provide groceries to people in need and to do the validation that people are in fact qualified to uh, to to get this um, the, this support. Uh, we have based we have built a complete uh, verifiable credential based solution for for them with the technology that we have. It's not an identity nexus use case, but it's 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 close enough so that we can just adjust the the things. And uh, the key um, um, topic we want to do um, to achieve is to also provide these learnings back to the global community. That's one of the key reasons we are active in the global ecosystems um, like Sovereign and Trust over IP. So my, my clear goal is to get everything that we do in ID Union basically packaged and, and de de deliverable ready for Trust over IP that others can learn from it and, and, and leverage the, the, the things that we have achieved here. And I think this is also something that is common in the in the German identity um, uh, landscape that people are eager to contribute and, and make it visible and available to the rest of the world. So I think this is a, a great position and a great collaboration among all involved. 
It's fantastic. Andre, for, uh, for people that are looking to uh, get in contact with you or, or your company or looking to contribute to the space, uh, where can people find you? Well, you can look at our website, isatus.com, E-S-A-T-U-S.com. Uh, we also have a, a Twitter account for Isatus and uh, for Isatus Self. Or you can reach out to me personally. I think uh, if you if you Google my, my name, Andre Kutra, <laughs> uh, in LinkedIn or in one of the other social networks, you, you come across um, myself. You can also uh, put in the show notes my email address and my Twitter account so that people can have a way to connect. So we are always looking forward to, to entertain discussions and, and work with you on, on your solutions. And uh, again, I very much appreciate that you are having me in, the, in your podcast series. Um, you, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of your work and I enjoy so much collaborating in the space on a trust OAP and every, everywhere we, we ran into each other. So I think this is a very fruitful relationship and I look forward to many great projects together. Likewise, Andre. Okay, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. To stay up to speed with future episode releases, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever channel you're listening to it right now. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out to me directly. You can find me online. I'm quite active on LinkedIn and Twitter, so I look forward to hearing from you. See you all next time.